When I get talking about mistletoe, I get a bit excited, so I want to get the acknowledgements out of the way first. Uh, so the work I'm presenting is about 26 years worth of work. The most important people in this work are landholders. I've done a lot of work on farms, on private land. So let's bust some myths. Please don't feel bad if you think all these things are true. They're not weeds and they're not introduced. So there are these things called robins in Europe. They're different robins to our robins. We've got our own robins, they've got their own robins. They've got magpies too, different magpies. They've got a mistletoe, we've got 97 mistletoes, and they're as Australian as kangaroos and gum trees. It was 96 up until Monday of this week. This bad boy was just described on Monday of this week. The snakewood mistletoe from the Pilbara, a glorious mistletoe up in the northwest corner of the country, found on, a, on an obscure acacia, um, north of uh, Carnarvon. So there's about a hundred species of mistletoe. They're all native. None of them are introduced. Most of them are found only in Australia. Toxic. Aren't they really toxic? Mistletoe, poisons, oh my gosh. Not so. They're widely consumed by wildlife, livestock, love them. If you keep cattle or sheep, you'll know that they'll seek out mistletoes. If a mistletoe falls down, horses, camels, donkeys, all sorts of domestic animals gobble it up. Don't they kill trees? They can. They can kill trees, but they kill trees about as frequently as fleas kill dogs. It's not in a flea's interests to kill a dog. It needs a living, breathing dog to make a living. Mistletoes are just the same as parasites. They need their trees to be happy, thriving, healthy plants. Otherwise, they're out of options. They are, they are literally bolted on to that tree. What we call mistletoes is a way of being a plant. It's a growth habit. It's an aerial, woody, parasitic plant. There are many other kinds of parasitic plants. Most of them do their things below ground. But what we're talking about here is, is a particular set um, of relationships between mistletoe and other organisms, what ecologists call interactions. And this really encapsulates a lot of those interactions. Uh, mistletoe uh, is a native plant that relies on all sorts of partners in order to do its thing. They're also important from a structural point of view as well as food. Uh, they're a dense ball of foliage in the canopy of trees. Many things gravitate towards that structure, um, both as a place to anchor their nest, but also from a microclimatic point of view, it's relatively cool, relatively humid. Um, and so little, little baby birds that are very, have trouble regulating their, their, their temperatures uh, are very susceptible to, to uh, fluctuating temperatures. Many, many birds, three quarters of all Australian birds that nest in foliage, in trees, have been recorded nesting in mistletoes. What do we find? Take mistletoe away, leave everything else intact, you lose a third of your birds. If it's so important, take it away, let's see what happens. Massive woodland, a few mistletoes in the canopy, remove a few plants, leave them where they fall, and a third of the species of woodland birds in that patch within three years have just cleared out. So direct experimental evidence that mistletoe really is promoting diversity in this system. And mistletoes uh, play a really big part in this story. Um, and in particular, this guy, uh, the grey mistletoe, uh, which is hosted by uh, wattle species. Uh, so this is the, the range map of the grey mistletoes. You know, these green dots here are all Hunter Valley. So it's pretty much the only coastal catchment where you get the uh, grey mistletoe in New South Wales. So we've got a number of birds that uh, come in to feed on these, these mistletoe, in particular spiny cheeks. They're a bird that's quite fond of, of mistletoe. Singing honey eaters, um, this is a really disjunct population at the top of the hunter. You've got to travel for another 150 kilometres or something before you strike singing honey eaters again. But really the most important bird I think, uh, well, the most interesting you know, sort of case study um, for grey mistletoe, a bird using it in the hunter is the painted honey eater. So it's now listed nationally, it was listed in New South Wales as vulnerable, it's now listed nationally as a, as a vulnerable species. Um, feeds mostly on, on mistletoe fruits. Um, but it has a particular liking for the grey mistletoe and other acacia-born um, mistletoes. So just talking about how important mistletoe is to some of these threatened woodland birds. So I work closely with Regent honey eaters uh, and Regent honey eaters um, preferentially go for eucalypt blossom. But when there's no eucalypt blossom around, uh, they 
will always turn to mistletoe when mistletoe is available. They will also turn to mistletoe anyway, um, but really it's, it's, it's all about following the, the, um, the eucalypt blossom. And in 2018, uh, you know, we, with BirdLife Australia and the Australian National University, we monitor about 1,400 sites across the range of the Regent Honey Eater in the breeding season, and we do it twice. Uh, so we've got a pretty fair idea on what's blossoming and where the birds are or aren't. The only place that we could even find birds, um, but it was certainly the only place that Regent honey eaters were breeding, was in the Hunter Economic Zone down in the spotted gum country around Cessna. And this is what they were feeding on, the um, long flowered mistletoe. So really, you know, when, when, there, when there isn't nectar available in other sources, the birds will turn to mistletoe because it's a, it's a very reliable food source. And not just for the nectar, also, also the fruits. So here we've got, we've got, we've got some trees in front of us. Um, you know, various ages. I don't know how old those trees are. Maybe 100 years, maybe 80 years. Um, and there's a heap of mistletoe in there. That mistletoe behind us there, good sized tree, start looking up into the canopy, you'll see lots of those uh, structures. Mistletoe seeds are naked seeds. They've got no seed coat. They're a photosynthetically active seed, they're green. So they need to be in a well-lit area in order to power their own germination and establishment. So mistletoe birds, all they eat is mistletoe fruit. All they feed their chicks is mistletoe fruit. So they actually, they're not that important a disperser to get mistletoe into new areas. They only go to places where there's already mistletoe. They go from mistletoe tree to mistletoe tree to mistletoe tree. Yeah, so they're one of those birds that, that go out of their way to nest in mistletoes. We've done some work on diamond firetails showing that although mistletoes represent about uh, a fraction of a percent of the canopy, um, they're more than two thirds of areas where, where we've documented diamond firetail nests, they're in mistletoes. So they seek to, to use them. So that's a new mistletoe for us, that, uh, that frosty one through there, just at eye height on the other side of the, uh, the gully. That's grey mistletoe, that's an acacia. It's got these frosty leaves, it's got a sort of a rough, like a sandpapery texture to it. So the mistletoe here that we're looking at, that's grey mistletoe in, uh, in an acacia, uh, which is the typical host for that species, that's Amy Maquandang in the acacia. But uh, it's interesting because there's a box mistletoe in there as well. Uh, and those two species, so Amy maquillii, which is a eucalypt species, they're typically found on eukes, but they, fla they fruit and flower on a similar schedule to the grey mistletoe. And so now and then you see them both in the same, in the same host because they've been brought there by, by mistletoe birds dispersing the fruit uh, at the same time. <laughs> 